in this video, we are going to talk about the flux pattern and why you might not want to use it together with Blazor. About a year ago, I was introduced to the flux pattern for the first time. I had never heard of it, so I asked my friend Peter Morris, could you please give me just a quick crash course? After working with it for a while, I decided that this is just too much ceremony for, for me, especially for what we were building at that point. There were no real benefits. So I started just deleting things, getting it back to running without the flux pattern. I deleted 1000 lines of code that day. And the only change in the UI was, I don't know what you did, but my God, the site feels so much faster. Now, I honestly don't know if there was any real performance differences. I never timed it. But I do know that the code was just so much easier to work with. Let's talk about the flux pattern. If you're building a Blazor app and you're thinking, huh, I should probably use the flux pattern or something like that for stage management. Let me stop you right there you probably don't need it. And honestly, it might be making your life way harder. So the flux pattern was created to solve a real problem in very large front-end apps. And you might say, hey, Jimmy, I got one of those. You probably don't. You got components all over the place and they all need access to a shared state or shared information. You want things to be predictable. So instead of updating the state directly, you go through a loop. You dispatch an action, the reducers run, the state gets updated, and your components get re-rendered. Boom! Clean, predictable, testable. But let's be real. Most Blazor apps just aren't that complex. It adds, say, layer of indirection that, in my opinion, makes the code way harder to read, debug, and follow. So let's say that we have a simple to-do list. You want to add a new item. In a Flux-style setup, using something like Fluxer, for example, the way you would do that, you would create an add to do action, you would dispatch it, you would create a reducer to handle it, maybe even an effect to call an API. Then you would dispatch another one saying add to do success action. Then you would update the state and in the end the UI would react to that update. And all of this just to add a to do item. Let's take a look at that. In this example, we are fetching the data, you're fetching all the to-dos, we can add a to-do item, and we can also toggle it whether or not it's done. So what do we need to do all of that? Well, I'm not going to go through all of this code. This code is available on GitHub, so you can get it and check it out yourself if you want to dive deeper into it. But if we take a look here, we have actions, we have add to-do action, we have a fetch to-dos action, we have a fetch to do's result action. So when we get the data back, we have the to do item added action, the to do item toggled action, and the toggle to do actions. All of these things, all of these classes are just ceremony. It doesn't add anything to the application itself. We have a to do effect because we're doing an API call that may or may not take a little bit of time. In that case, we're using an effect. We have a to-do feature that sets everything up. We have the to-do reducers and a to-do state. We also have to-do service, but well, that is just for data management, so we can't really get rid of that in any case. And if we take a look here in the to-do reducers clause or file, I should say, we have a static class and we are handling all of these different reducers. So we have these reducer method attributes. We have methods to handle each of these, in this case, fetch to do's result action. 
So what is happening when we get that result back? We're getting all of the to-do items. Well, if we do that, then we're going to update the state here. So all of this code is just to get the flux pattern going. So in this sample, I have a to-do service, and that's the whole thing. The only other thing that we need to have is the to-do item. Other than that, we're all set up now. No other files involved for this one. So the only thing that we need to do is that in this case, we got get to do items async. So when I call this one, I also call items change. So I have an event that I can listen to if I change something and I want to make the UI update. So the only thing we need is the item change and also, of course, an action that we can hook into and listen to. This basically replaces all of the other code that you saw in the Flux pattern demo. So what about editing a customer? Well, just get the latest data. Show the edit form. When you save, go back to read-only view. No need to keep state outside of the component. Just keep it in there. And if that component goes away, so does the state. Spend time in making the APIs faster if that's an issue. And you're going to be fine. I have a theory, and tell me if you agree or not. Most developers that use the Flux pattern in Blazor comes from another platform like Angular, where this pattern is more common. And they just assume that this is something that we need for Blazor too. Most of the time, you don't. If you need shared state or a way to trigger updates, you can just use a scoped service like the one that I showed you with an event or a delegate or something like that. Now, are there cases where the flux pattern makes sense in Blazor? Sure. If you're building a massive app with lots of independent widgets that all need to stay in sync, then maybe. Peter Morris, the creator of Fluxer, called me out on Reddit once, in the nicest way, of course. Because I said that you never need the Flux pattern for Blazor. Now, I did that because I believe that in most cases, in 99% of the cases, you don't need that. But I used a very absolute way of saying that, and he's absolutely right there are places where this pattern makes sense. So I sat down with Peter and we talked a little bit about this. And he said that if your app's entities are only updated in one place, like for example, in a CRUD app, then it's probably not a good fit. But if you have multiple independence view states, like widgets on a dashboard, for example, that also needs to stay in sync, where updates may come from basically anywhere, then the Flux pattern is a good candidate. It's about using the right tool for the right job. You might even use Flux only for a part of your app and something simpler for the rest of it. And I thought that that was such a good take on things. He continued, if you aren't reducing the state into a custom view, I don't see much point in using it and it being the flux pattern in this case. Otherwise, you're simply using it for state change notifications. And that's not really the point. Its purpose really is to allow you to have a custom view of the data that is constructed from external data and can be stored in isolation so that it also can be wiped from memory completely without affecting any part of the app. We also don't need to go all in on a pattern or a framework. Sometimes parts of your app needs different approaches. Peter said that I can see an app where you use the flux pattern, Rx, scoped state, component state, all at once. Where we would use component state for simple CRUD, Rx for stock tickers, we can use scope state for some sharing between different components. And we would use Fluxer for dashboards with a lot of widgets or perhaps a 
complex edit screens. It's not about shared state. It's about keeping isolated state in sync. Facebook, for example, is a great example. When you open your messages, they don't load everything. You might see like 10 messages and a badge that says 1000 unread messages. That badge comes from a single database query. As you read messages and receive new ones, delta updates are applied. And this is where the flux pattern shines. If you're not building something like that, you probably don't need it. I usually say that simplicity is a superpower. Simple code is easier to understand, easier to debug, easier to hand off to someone else. If you need some kind of global state inside a blazer, use a scoped service. If you need reactivity, use an event or a delegate. You don't need actions, reducers, and effects just to set a value. Some people really like the flux pattern. It's okay. If you like it, continue to use it. And if you do like it, please let me know in the comments below because I would love to hear your take on all of this. Now, personally, it's just too much ceremony for my project. And to this day, I have not found a project where it makes sense to me. There are other libraries, I mentioned it, Time Warp State, for example, that removes some of the boilerplate. So that might be a better fit for you. They use source generators to simplify effects and state updates. And you can find that demo code on my Dome Train course as well. And speaking on that, all the code samples that you have seen is from my Dome Train Blazor deep dive course. So if you want to learn more about state management in Blazor, please check that out on dometrain.com. You have a link in the description here below as well. So before you add a full-blown Flux architecture into your Blazor app, stop and ask, am I solving a real problem? Or am I just following a pattern that I used to use in Angular? If this helped you rethink some choices, hit like. Share it with someone who are over-engineering a counter app. And don't forget to subscribe to Coding After Work. Keep it simple. Keep it maintainable. And please stop using the flux pattern in every Blazor app. See you in the next video.